Good evening. We're here with um, Commissioner Peter Steinbrook, who's running for Port of Seattle position number four. Peter, would you like to go ahead and uh, go ahead with your two minutes? Great. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, 36ers. I'm Peter Steinbrook, Seattle Port Commissioner. I'm also an architect, a community planner, principal at Steinbrook Urban Strategies to advance healthy, livable, and walkable cities and communities. And uh, public and life has been an important part of my entire uh, working life, both civically, politically, and professionally uh, working in the public interest. And I think that's probably why I'm at the port is because it's where I feel I can do the, the greatest good to the greatest number of people. Uh, you may wonder, well, what's in the port for us? Well, you might see the cranes, you might see the airport, but really, it's, the emission is a driver for economic development and living wage jobs. And equitable living wage jobs, I would add to that, is our mantra. And I want to advance uh, equitable economic recovery and greening the port and bringing transparent, open, ethical government uh, to the institution. And I've made a lot of progress in all of those areas. As port commissioner president last year, I led the port through the worst human crisis in a century, human and financial, with no layoffs, an excellent safety record for our employees as well as our construction workers and others. And we have a strong equitable COVID recovery uh, package that is moving forward. At the seaport, we created thousands of living wage construction jobs and dock worker jobs at our terminals with the modernization of Terminal 5, which will make us more competitive on, on the West Coast ports as the global shipping uh, conditions have changed dramatically when it comes to discretionary cargo. For underserved communities, I created a $10 million South King County Community Fund in 2019, even before COVID. Uh, in order to address the longstanding inequities and disadvantages of many uh, low-income communities of color in South King County. Finally, in this time of racial yes. reckoning, I created the first ever commission task force on policing and civil rights to address systemic racism and reform policing practices. Thank Thanks. you. Perfect timing. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. So now we'll move into our the first of our prepared questions. Um, I'm going to, there we go. And I'll place that into the chat. The speaking order or the question order that I have right now is uh, Sarah McKenzie, then Summer and Alice. So um, question number one, Sarah. Um, these responses are two minutes apiece. Hi, hey, Peter. Okay. Um, COVID has increased existing inequities. As a port commissioner, how would you support the most vulnerable or have you supported the most vulnerable? And how would you promote an equitable recovery and create opportunity for all through the port? Sure, well, this is um, essential to everything we do that we uh, open up opportunities uh, to uh, support communities that have been historically disadvantaged and underserved particularly communities of color and low-income communities. As I mentioned, the $10 million community fund is intended to serve just that, to serve underserved communities, to create jobs around, uh, gr green jobs, I should say, and uh, economic development opportunities in those communities through grant making. Um, we also have a youth opportunity initiative that we um, launched last summer that provided some 200 job training and pipeline opportunities for predominantly youth of color uh, and from disadvantaged communities to engage in some of the um, important uh, work around habitat restoration in the, in the Duwamish River and uh, in other areas um, the, of the Duwamish Valley and, and South King County. Um, we will continue to work on strategies to expand opportunity. We do that also through um, our, our uh, Women in Contracting uh, Diversity Program at the port where we've tripled uh, the participation of women and minority contractors from where it was when I started the port, which is around five and a half percent to now over 15 percent uh, inclusion, despite the challenges of I-200 and, and affirmative action limitations. We'll continue to work on that program to create more opportunities uh, for, for participation from 
historically disadvantaged, underserved, and frankly, uh, communities that have uh, businesses that have been discriminated against. Uh, there are more ways that we can continue this work. I think um, through job um, internships at the port is another one that supports youth uh, through training um, and paid jobs uh, that uh, actually pay and get school credit time. for. We Thanks. also started the Maritime High School uh, program, uh, which is uh, uh, going to produce some really great results. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to place question two into the chat so you could follow along as Mackenzie um, asked this one. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, how have you worked to combat climate change and promote climate justice? And how would you ensure that the port drastically lowers net carbon emissions by 2030 and achieves carbon ne uh, neutrality by 2050? Yeah, well, first of all, I think 2050 is too far out. I think we have to work more aggressively. I, I never have liked that date. <laughs> it's too far out. It's beyond the planning horizon of anybody who's, a, who's uh, employed these days. We are planning to electrify the entire seaport, which means both Tacoma and Seattle, the waterfronts, by 2030. And we have um, announced and launched an aggressive program to do just that so that there will be um, full shore power, it's called cold ironing at, at our seaports. We, we won't stop there though, that we, we are looking to develop some drage trucks or working with partners like PACCAR for um, a new breed of trucks that uh, run either on hydrogen fuel or electric trucks that can eliminate air pollution altogether. Uh, we've already started that effort through the clean truck program, which has gotten about over 95% of all the trucks are 80% cleaner than they were uh, uh, previously with our clean truck program that has uh, basically salvaged and replaced most of those trucks. Um, so there's lots of ways that we're working to green the port. It is something that is a top priority for me. I am the chair of the Environment and Sustainability Committee. I've signed the Green, uh, the, uh, green New Deal pledge and I've launched a new program that I just announced last week, a five point plan uh, to advance greening of the port. I don't have time to go into all the details, but would be happy to sh share more of that with you later. So I'm excited about the potential. We have no time to lose when it comes to climate protection. Time is running out and the planet can't wait. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so now moving on to question number three, and I believe that is Summer. Port has operations and activities on tribal and indigenous land. How would you use your position to elevate indigenous people and encourage more equity and opportunity for black indigenous and people of color communities? Give oh, us great. Um, examples of your plans in this aspect. Okay. How you handle your approach to women and POC owned businesses. Okay, wait, there were two parts to that question. One is tribal and what was the other part? I'm sorry. Uh, one is tribal, and then also give sp some specific examples of your plans in this aspect. And then the other one was, um, how would you handle your approach to women and uh, people of color owned businesses? Okay, I mentioned some of that. But regarding tribal, I am um, co-chair of the Ports Tribal Liaison Committee uh, and also the Seaport. I have a long history of work working with indigenous peoples locally uh, with groups like uh, Labatea Youth Home at United uh, Indians of All Tribes. Currently with the Duwamish Tribal Council, we're putting, uh, we're doing habitat restoration and we're joining them in a celebratory friendship poll that is going to be mounted in, in one of the newly named par river parks uh, that are within the port's jurisdiction there. Um, I also introduced the very first acknowledgement as port president last year, that we are not just on tribal lands of the Coast Salish, but it is the culture as well. And I think too often, all that's referenced there is these are tribal lands, we must respect them. Yes, indeed. But uh, the uh, indigenous peoples are still here and they have a history that's far longer than ours and we need to acknowledge more of that. Uh, so I will continue to work to whenever there is an issue that impacts tribal sovereign lands, we will engage in consultation before any 
commitments are made or any actions taken. That's number one. And through our seaport, I'm working closely on issues regarding um, the um, treaty rights with regard to traditional fishing and ensuring that the tribes, in our case uh, here in Seattle, <clears throat> the Muckleshoots and the Susquamish are adequately compensated for any loss of, of tribal fishing during their traditional locations and seasons in Elliott Bay and Puget Sound, uh, and that we will work to mitigate, and again, in consultation with the tribes, uh, any construction projects that could potentially impact uh, their activ traditional activities and rights. And that's your time, thanks. Okay. And I didn't get to the women and minorities, but I spoke to it a little so earlier. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so now I'm gonna put question four into the chat and Alice, I believe that one is yours. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is the port's responsibility when it comes to protecting and lifting up workers? What do you think are some opportunities for improving the port's relationship with organized labor and those workers who do not currently have access to the protection of a union such as Uber and Lyft drivers? Well, first of all, I come from a very strong pro-labor, pro-workers rights, pro-organizing uh, family background. Going back to the early 20th century during the great general strike of Seattle, my grandfather who worked at the shipyards and before that the railroad as a labor organizer was laid off as a result of what was called rebel rousing then. And, you know, and uh, he lost his job, but he, he helped organize the efforts around the general strike. My family has been continuously involved in labor activism since those days. Um, so <clears throat> recently I stepped in to help the kitchen workers at SeaTac Airport, a little known group that was exempted from the $15 wage initiative. And they're underpaid, many having two or three jobs, mostly immigrant and community and people of color. We got um, Senator Kaiser to pass authorizing legislation that just passed yesterday to allow the port to em enforce labor uh, rights, excuse me, labor regulation first ever. We are not a regulator, but in this case, we got authorization, especially to address the inequities of the kitchen workers who prepare the food that you eat on your planes. We've had no help from the airlines and it's a little known um, as far as uh, the traveler's awareness and the community, how they have suffered unjustly for all this time. And that's something we're gonna remedy immediately. Um, other part of that, <laughs> excuse me, of the question was how to, up, how to lift up workers Working with labor, I consider them part of the team. They are our partners and organized labor, union jobs pay 20% more across the board than other comparable jobs in the state of Washington. Next. And I'm proud of that. And we have a proud safety record as well at the port. Great, thank you. So that's the end of our prepared questions. And so now we're gonna open it up to follow-up questions. Uh, does anybody have a follow-up question? Yeah, um, I have one. Okay, and the responses to these would be one minute in length. Right, ahead, um, so I'm, I, I'm not totally sure um, um, how you're gonna answer this, but what is the port's responsibility in sort of facilitating walkable, um, bikeable, safe, mm -hmm. livable communities. Um, I, I think often there's, it's perceived that there's a tension between um, the needs of the port and the trucking industry yeah. and the needs of people to, you know, move safely out of a vehicle. Um, so what's your, what's oh, your take Alice, that's a perfect question. And I, I do have a specific example. I do care a great deal about uh, pedestrian bicycle safety, about advancing healthy, walkable, livable communities. That has been the core of my professional consulting practice, my expertise in land use and planning. And I have decades of, of experience developing innovative cutting edge practices for cities that have been borrowed around the country. But with uh, one of the things that I did years ago, and I won't rest on those laurels, but was to establish the first ever complete streets policy at the city of Seattle that requires that streets be built for all modes and that they also be 
ecologically regenerative by collecting storm runoff the, rather than dumping it in combined sewer overflows and treating it on site. But most recently, I want to talk about is the West Marginal Way issue uh, as a result in part to the bridge shutdown. There's been quite a bit more traffic there. And it is also a designated bike route under the city's ma uh, bicycle master plan, which I helped create, uh, and also a freight corridor. It could be another missing link, debacle, like out, like out at Shill Show, if we don't do something to balance the needs of both. So I'm advocating for a dedicated pedestrian bicycle, grade separated uh, lane or trail, if you will, that would be continuous from Spokane Street down south uh, so that bicycles aren't risking, bicyclists are not at risk of truck turns and fast moving traffic and will have their own dedicated right away. So it's an area I care a lot about and, and have a lot of knowledge and experience in. Thank you for the question. I let you go a little long because I was interested okay. in the answer. That's a little hard to, <laughs> I'm never good at these uh, one and two minute things. So I apologize. That's okay. Uh, are there any other follow-up questions? Any other follow-up questions? I can ask one. Sure, go ahead. Um, what are you most proud of in terms of accomplishments as a port commissioner? And if there's one thing you could do differently, what would it have been? Sure. Well, I think I'm most proud of advancing the port's core mission, which is livable wage jobs while greening the port and doing it equitably and addressing the social inequities. So um, I would also add that I have opened the port up to greater transparency accountability and engagement. And I've done that through holding more open meetings, through posting committee agendas that previously were completely out of the public realm to having uh, public hearings before we take a vote on, uh, on the budget, to requiring the police to actually report out to the commission and the public annually, institutionally. Never before has this been done. I also called on the same for the audit director to give an annual report in public and to make all audits accessible on the website. So I, those are the areas I feel like I've made some significant institutional reforms and kept my commitments from the last time I was here at the 36 doing the, my first interview for my uh, candidacy at the That's port in time. 2017. Greening the port, um, great uh, livable wage jobs, and institutional reforms to hold the port accountable and transparent and increase civic engagement. Um, there are some specific programs I'm very proud of. Hi, sorry. Yep. That's <laughs> okay. okay. I'll give you the extra minute if you'd like to talk about those there programs. We go. go ahead. Well, <clears throat> well, sure. Um, I, I'm, I, I wanted to mention a little bit about the uh, commission on the, uh, the task force on policing and civil rights 45 days after George Floyd, after the brutal murder of George Floyd, first thing we did, and I urged as council commission president, a immediate ban on chokeholds and neck restraints. We didn't wait around for the laws to change or for somebody to pressure us. We have a police force that's actively engaged in dangerous situations nearly every day, 110 or so uh, sworn police officers also responsible for mutual aid to cities. And they, per, they perform those duties all the time. So we're just like everybody else, but we have the opportunity to be the best police force, I would say guardian force in the, in the country rather than a warrior like police. And we're doing that through a, an incredibly great group of stakeholders internally and externally led by our our resource group at the Next port time. and our office of equity. Great, Thanks. thank you so much. And now I'm gonna go ahead and give you a minute to uh, wrap up and tell the folks of the 36th okay. district why they should uh, elect you. All right, well, thank you. And thanks, thanks again for this opportunity and for your civic engagement. I know this is time consuming and it's very important to have this level of de democratic engagement. I am a strong lifelong Democrat. I believe in the democratic principles that we all uh, value. I have read the 36th platform and I'm aware of your priorities and your mission. 
and I support them all, and I've lived to I've lived up to them all in my work. I bring the um, probably the the best um, unmatched experience and knowledge in public policy of anybody at the port, elected or running for office, and I apply that to problem solving and innovative solutions that we know we need. I'm not there to preserve the status quo. I, I'm there to bring about meaningful and important changes. And I bring all of that experience as well as uh, principled strong leadership to the port, which I've also demonstrated. I am mission driven as opposed to ambition driven. Some people see the port uh, commission positions as a stepping stone to other higher offices. That is not why I'm there. And I think that should be very clear. So I That's will- That's time. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you so Aggressive much. Aggressive leadership.